the autobiography of C. H. Spurgeon, chapter 100. Mr. Spurgeon as the literary man. God gave Elijah 40 days meat at one meal. Do you, dear friends, ever get such meals as that? I do when I read certain books, not modern thought books. Give me no such fare as that, a grain of meal to a gallon of water. But let me have one of the good, solid Puritan volumes that are so little prized nowadays, and my soul can feed upon such blessed food as that and be satisfied with it. C.H.S. in sermon preached at the Tabernacle, June 24, 1883. If you can read a tainted book that denies the inspiration of the scriptures and attacks the truth of God, and if you derive any profit from it, you must be a very different being from myself. I have to read such books. I must read them sometimes to know what is said by the enemies of the gospel, that I may defend the faith and help the weaklings of the flock. But it is a sorry business. When those who are qualified to do so are reading these heretical books, if they are doing it really in the fear of God for the good of their fellow men, they remind me of Sir James Simpson and two other doctors when they discovered the medical and surgical value of chloroform. They sat at the table and scarcely knew what was going to happen. But they took a dose each, risking their lives by so doing. And when they came back to consciousness, they had certainly made a great discovery. C.H.S. in Sermon Preached at the Tabernacle, October 29, 1885. The world gets more civilized, so I am told. Though, when I read the newspapers, I am not quite sure that it is so. The world gets more intelligent, so I am told. Though, when I read the magazines, I mean the high-class quarterlies, I am not certain that it is so. For in that direction, the ignorancy appears to me to become greater every day. I mean the ignorancy among the learned and scientific men, who seem to me, in their discoveries, continually to wander further and further, not only from that which is revealed and infallible, but also from that which is rational and truthful. C.H.S. in Sermon Preached at the Tabernacle, May 28, 1882. What a storehouse the Bible is, since a man may continue to preach from it for years and still find that there is more to preach from then when he began to discourse upon it. What pyramids of books have been written upon the Bible, and yet we who are students find no portion over-expounded, but large parts which are scarcely touched. If you take Darling's Cyclopedia and look at a text which one divine has preached upon, you will see that dozens have done the same. But there are hundreds of texts which remain like virgin summits, whereon the foot of preacher has never stood. I might almost say that the major part of the word of God is in that condition. It is still in El Dorado unexplored, a land whose dust is gold. CHS in speech, Bible Society meeting, 1882. No life of Mr. Spurgeon would be complete unless it contained all available information concerning the books he read or wrote or owned. All who have been intimately acquainted with him from his childhood or in later years have testified to the omnivarious character of his reading. In the earlier part of the present work, Volume 1, Chapter 3, he has himself recorded the delight with which, while he was but a little lad, he revealed in the study of such works as Fox's Book of Martyrs, Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, and the huge folios of Puritan theology, which he had discovered in the windowless room in the upper portion of the old Stamborny mansion. The book and the boy were inseparable companions, and when he returned from Stamborny, 
to Colchester, and afterwards went to his uncle's school at Maidstone, the same experience was repeated. Even as a youth, he intermeddled with all knowledge, and so became to begin to accumulate those treasures of literary lore which have led many to describe his wisdom as encyclopedic. His essay, entitled Popery Unmasked, written when he was only 15 years of age, affords abundant proof of the wide extent of his reading at that early period of his history, and he often met, mentioned with much merriment the curious arrangement that had to be made in connection with the schoolboy debates in which he took part. He knew so much more than the rest of the pupils upon almost all the subjects which they wished to discuss that he was too formidable an antagonist for any of them to overthrow, and consequently the only way in which he could fairly compete with his young companions was to allow him to speak on both sides of the question under consideration. It must have been both amused and amazed his fellow scholars to hear him refute his own arguments, which, when he had first uttered them, they had thought to be unanswerable. When he advanced from the position of scholar to that of teacher, he gladly availed himself of the increased opportunities of reading and learning everything that might be turned to good account in his future career. And when he had become a follower of Christ and an earnest, earnest worker for the Lord, he spent all that he could honestly afford in the purchase of the classical and theological books which were likely to be of the greatest service to him. His letters at that period, as given in the first volume of this work, contain frequent mention of those volumes, and his tutor and friend, Mr. Leading, confirmed his own testimony as to the diligence with which he was mastering their contents. One of his favorite subjects of study at that time was natural history, and some of his pupils have acknowledged, even since his home-going, how intensely interesting and instructive were the lessons and lectures he gave them upon that topic. And all the while he was, perhaps unconsciously, laying up useful and telling illustrations which were to be of service to himself and his hearers throughout his long ministry. Mr. Spurgeon did not often refer to his own literary acquirements, as he preferred to let the work he had accomplished speak for him, and he could afford to ignore the unfounded assumptions of his critics with regard to his supposed ignorancy. Very occasionally, possibly, when there had been some unusual virulent attack upon him that he thought should not pass unnoticed. He would briefly mention the matter to some of the choicest friends by whom he was surrounded and prove the utter groundlessness of his assailant's statements. At the close of one of the annual college conferences, there occurred an incident of this kind, which is to this day remembered with delight by many who were present. One of the brethren who was there has recorded his remnants of the occasion. He writes, it was after the dinner on the Friday which he had been cheering the beloved president with such cheers as he shall never give to any man again. I think they must have touched his loving heart, for he left his place at the table, stepped forward among the flowers that decorated the platform, and talked to us in a homely, confident way. I cannot recall his exact words, but I know that he told us how welcome we were to all the privileges of the conference, and I remember that he had a special message of sympathy for those of us who came from the smaller churches. Then he went on to speak of himself. He related how, even as a schoolboy, he had made such progress with his mathematical studies that he had been able to calculate the tables which he believed were still used in a certain life insurance office in London. I distinctly re recollect that he also said he could easily have taken a degree at Cambridge if the university had 
been open to nonconformists, and he referred to the knowledge of Greek and Latin which he possessed at that time, adding to his own intimidable way that since then he had also learned at least some Hebrew and a few other things. He urged the brethren to be diligent students, to read all books which would help them to understand the scriptures, but above all, to study the word itself in the original languages, if possible, and to saturate themselves with what he termed Bible, the very essence of the book. I always knew that dear Mr. Spurgeon was a great scholar, as well as a great preacher, but it was delightful to have the fact confirmed from his own lips. Yet he concluded by saying, Still, brethren, like the Apostle Paul, I am become a fool and glory. But our renewed cheers must have assured him of our delight in listening to what he had told us. And he said that he had been driven to speak by what others had been saying, and for the honor of the college of which he was president. The address was evidently quite unpremeditated. It seemed to be the overflowing of his heart to those who he knew, who were not only in perfect sympathy with him, but regarded him with the deepest reverency, esteem, and love. Although Mr. Spurgeon so seldom referred to his own attainment and qualifications for his great life work, yet frequently, in despicking some of the Lord's most useful and successful servants, he drew likenesses of them, which might admirably serve for folding portraits of himself. For instance, preaching upon the John the Baptist words, he must increase, but I must decrease. The pastor said, Oh, how grandly he witnessed for Christ by sinking himself until he was lost in the Lord and Master. And my brother, it must be the same with you. If you would be a true witness for Christ, you must say, That which glories glorifies him, even though it dishonors yourself. Perhaps there is a very learned man sitting over yonder, and the temptation up to the preacher is to say something that shall make him feel that the minister to whom he is listening is not so ignorant as some people suppose. But if there is an unlearned simple sinner anywhere in the place, the preacher's business is just to chop his words down to that poor man's condition and let the learned hearers receive the same message, if you will. Luther said, When I am preaching, I see Dr. Jonas sitting there. And, M-E-L-A-N-C-T-H-O-N. And I say to myself, Those London doctors know enough already, so I will not trouble about them. I shall fire at the poor person in the aisles. That is the way Luther preached, and God richly blessed his ministry because he did it. Though he was a truly learned man, he was willing to be reckoned as knowing nothing at all if by that means he could the better serve his Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. On another occasion, in a sermon at the tabernacle, his reference to John Bunyan was greatly appreciable to his own writings and words. Oh, that you and I might get into the very heart of the Word of God and get that Word into ourselves. As I have seen the silkworm eat into the loaf and consume it, so ought we to do with the Word of the Lord. Not crawl over its surface, but eat right into it till we have taken it into our innermost parts. It is idle merely to, the, to let the eye glance over the words or to recollect the poetic expressions or the historical facts. But it is blessed to eat into the very soul of the Bible until, at last, you come to talk in scriptural language and your very style is fashioned upon scriptural models and, what is better still, your spirit is flavored with the words of the Lord. I would quote John Bunyan as an incident of what I mean. Read anything of his and you will see what it is almost like reading the Bible itself. He has studied our authorized version, which will never be bettered, as I judge, till Christ shall come. He had read it till his whole being was saturated with Scripture. 
and though his writings were charmingly full of poetry, yet he cannot give us his Pilgrim's Progress, that sweetest of all Poe's poems, without continually making us feel and say, why this man is a living Bible. Prick him anywhere, and you will find that his blood is Bibling. The very essence of the Bible flows from him. He cannot speak without quoting a text, for his soul is full of the Word of God. In the contemplation, compilation of the illustrative extracts for the treasury of David, it was from lack of time rather than from personal inability that Mr. Spurgeon was glad to avail himself to the assistance of a few friends, whose help he gratefully acknowledged in the prefaces to the various volumes as they were issued. One of these references will serve as a specimen of the whole, and at the same time it will indicate to careful readers the heavy labor which had been undertaken in the consciousness with which it was being performed. In the introduction of Volume 3, Mr. Spurgeon wrote, Art is long and life is short. Hence I found myself unequal to the unaided accompaniment of the, my task. And I have had to call in the aid of an excellent friend, Mr. Gracie, the accomplished classic tutor of the pastor's college, to assist me in the work of widowing the enormous heaps of Latin comments, huge folios full of dreary word spinning, yield here and there some little materials for thought. And this, I trust, will be valuable enough to my readers to repay my co-adjudgers and myself for our pains. For the selection of extracts, I am I alone am responsible. For the accuracy of the translations, we are jointly accountable. The reader will note that, not without much expense of money, as well as toil, he has here furnished to the hand the pith of numerous authors with occasional notes from other numerous authors, as they are judged worthy of insertion. I can truly say that I have never flinched from a difficulty or spared ex exertion in order to make the work as complete as it lay in my power to render it, even by my own endeavors or the help of others. Perhaps among all Mr. Spurgeon's published works, the one that gives the best idea of his familiarity with the whole range of ex expository literature is his unpretentious half-crown volume issued under the unattractive title Commenting in Commentaries. The book has long since been accepted as a most reliable standard of appeal, and its commendations and valuations are frequently quoted in catalogs of theological work. The purpose of the volume and the labor necessary for its completion are thus described by its authors. Author. Divines who have studied the scripture have left us great stories of holy thought, which we do well to use. Their exposition can never be a substitute for our own meditations, but as water poured down a dry pump often starts it working to bring up water of its own, so suggestive reading sets the mind to motion of its own account. Here, however, is the difficulty. Students do not find it easy to choose which works to buy, and their slender stores are often wasted on books of a comparatively worthless kind. If I can save a poor man from spending his money for that which is not bread, or by directing a brother to a good book, may enable him to dig deeper into the mines of truth, I shall be well repaid. For this purpose I have toiled and read much, and passed under review some three or four thousand volumes. From these I have compiled my catalog, rejecting many, yet making a very varied uh, variety selection. Though I have carefully used such judgment as I possess, I have doubtless made many errors. I shall certainly find very few 
who will agree with all my criticism, and some persons may be angry at my remarks. I have done nothing extenuant, nor set down aught in malice. He who finds fault will do well to excuse the work in better style. Only let him remember that he will have my heifer to plow with, and therefore ought in all reason to excel me. I have used the degree of pleasantry in my remarks on the commentaries, for a catalog is a dry affair, and as much for my own sake as for that of my readers, I have indulged the mirthful vein here and there. For this, I hope, I shall escape censor, even if I do not win accommodations. Few can conceive the amount of toil which, which this compilation has involved, but to myself and my industrious Mr. J. L. Keyes. In almost every case, the books have been actually examined by myself, and my opinion, whatever it may be worth, is an original one. A complete list of all comments has not been attempted. Numbers of volumes have been left out because they were not easily obtainable or were judged to be worthless, although some of both these classes have been admitted by specimens or as warnings. Latin authors are not uncertain, because few can procure them, and fewer still can read them with ease. We are not, however, ignorant of their value. The writers on the prophetic books have completely mastered us, and after almost completing a full list, we could not in our conscience believe that a tithe of them would yield to the student anything but bewilderment, and therefore we reduce the number to small dimensions. We reverence the teaching of the prophets and the apocryphus, but for many of the professed expounders of those inspired books, we entertain another feeling. Some of the readers of Mr. Spurgeon's sermons and other works, noticing how seldom he inserts classical quotations, or referred to the languages in which the script scriptures were written, may have imagined that he was not acquainted with those treasures of wisdom and knowledge. The real reason for the omission can be gathered from his warning words to his students in his lecture on commenting, avoid all pedantry. A pedant who is continually quoting Ambrose and Jer Jerome in order to show what a copious reader he has been, is usually a dealer in small wares, and quotes only what others have quoted before him. But he who can give you the result and overcome a very extensive reading without sounding a trumpet before him is the really learned man. As a general rule, it may be observed that those gentlemen who know the least Greek are the most sure to air their rags of learning in the pulpit. They miss no chance of saying, the Greek is so-and-so. It makes a man an inch and a half taller by a fulometer. If he constantly lets fall bits of Greek and Hebrew, and even tells the people the tense of the verb in the case of a noun, so as I have known some to do. Those who have no learning usually make a point of displaying the pegs on which learning ought to hang. Brethren, the whole process of interpretation is to be carried on in your study. You are not to show your congregation the process, but to give them the result, like a good cook who would never think of bringing up dishes and pans and rolling pins and spice box into the dining room, but without abstention, send up the feast. In the volume of lectures to students on the art of illustration, the president incidentally uh, indicated his wide acquaintance with all kinds of literature, from which anecdotes, illustrations, emblems, metaphors, and similes might be culled. The following extract shows how Mr. Spurgeon turned an illustration used by Henry Ward Beecher to quite a different purpose from the one intended by the eminent American preacher. When a critical adversary attacks our metaphors, 
he generally makes short work of them. To friendly minds, Im images are arguments, but to opponents, they are opportunities for attack. The enemy climbs up by the window. Comparisons are swords with two edges, which cut both ways, and frequently what seems a sharp and telling illustration may be wittily turned against you so as to cause a laugh at your expense. Therefore, do not rely upon your metaphors and parables. Even a second-rate man may defend himself from a superior mind if he can dex dexterously turn his assailant's guns upon himself. Here is an incident which, which concerns myself, and I give it for that reason. Since these lectures have all along been autobiographical, it is a cutting from one of our religious papers. Mr. Beecher has been neatly tripped up in the sword in the trowel in his lectures on preaching. He asserts that Mr. Spurgeon has succeeded in spite of his Calvinism, adding the remark, the camel does not travel any better, nor is it any more useful because of the hump on its back. The illustration is not a happy one. For Mr. Spurgeon thus retorts, Naturalists assure us that the camel's hump is for the great importancy of the eyes of the Arab, who judge of the condition of the beast by the size, shape, and firmness of their humps. The camel feeds into his hump when he transverses the wilderness, so that in proportion as the animal travels over the sandy waste, and suffers from privation and fatigue, the mass diminishes, and he is not fit for a long journey till the hump has regained its usual proportions. Calvinism, then, is the spiritual meat, which enables a man to labor on in the ways of Christian service, and though ridiculed as a hump by those who are only lookers-on, those who traverse the weary paths of a wilderness experience know too well its value to be willing to part with it even if a beecher's splendid talents could be given in exchange. In 28 volumes of The Sword in the Trowel from 1865 to 1892 contain notices of many thousands of books that the beloved editor either read through or examined sufficiently to be able to read reviews of them. He also read many that he did not review, for he was well aware that an unfavorable notice in his magazine would help to advertise erroneous teaching, and he thought the wiser course was to ignore such work altogether. His usual method of dealing with a thoroughly bad book, either morally or doctrinally, was to tear it into little pieces too small to do harm to anyone, or to commit it bodily to the flames. This was the sentence executed upon many volumes that cast doubt upon the divinity of our Lord, the efficiency of his atoning sacrifice, or the inspiration of the scriptures. Though some works of that kind were allowed to remain as evidences of the character of the writings of some of the religious leaders of the day. In one notable incident, a volume by a very prominent Baptist minister, with whom Mr. Spurgeon was personally friendly, but with whom he was widely separated theologically, was adversely criticized with considerable severity before publishing the notice. The editor sent a proof of it to the author of the book, and then, at his urgent request, omitted it from the magazine. On the other hand, publishers and writers have frequently testified that a commendation in the sword and the trial had been the means of selling the whole edition, or of materially helping to ensure the success of their works, while all who were well acquainted with the magazine are fully aware of the unique character of the editor's notices of books. Even on his holiday trips to Mentum, Mr. Spurgeon was always well supplied with material for reading. Not only did he take large quantities of books with him, that many others were sent out to him during the time of his enforced absence from home. He generally took care in making his selection for this purpose to include some biographies or 
one or two of his favorite Puritans, such as Mandan or Brooks. On one occasion, there seemed to be some little likelihood of his literary luggage being confiscated by the French officials. It may be that they were especially suspicious at that time because the ex-empress Eugenia had crossed the channel by some steamer and they could not tell how much imperialistic literature was being smuggled into the Republic. Although they could find nothing of a contraband nature, they carefully examined several volumes of the dear pastor's own work, which were intended for as presents for friends, and others which had been sent to him for review. But finding nothing to which they could object, they at least appended the mystic mark which gave free admission to all that the huge container contained. Mr. Spurgeon was a very quick reader, but the rapidity of his glance at the page did not interfere with the completeness of his acquaintance with its contents. He could read from cover to cover of a large octavio, octavio or folio volume in the course of a very short space of time and he would thus become perfectly familiar with all that it contained. Dr. William Wright, the late editor-superintendent of the British and Foreign Bible Society, gave a remarkable incident of this combination of speed and accuracy, as well as a notable testimony to Mr. Spurgeon's literary ability in the remembrances which he wrote for the British Weekly in February 1892. In the course of a lengthy article, Dr. Wright said, Mr. Spurgeon visited Belfast in 1858. I was then preparing to enter college for the hankering after the Indian service, civil service. Mr. Spurgeon preached in, Mr. in Dr. Cook's church. He singled me out, as I thought, and spoke to me as if no one else were, was present. There was no thrumming of theology and no pious posting, but a clear, direct, hot, living, personal peer appeal that dared not be resisted. Fifteen years later, I went to the tabernacle on my way home from Damascus. The same straightforward Englishman was preaching the same straightforward gospel in all its fullness and without any apology for its severity. After the service, I walked into the vestry without being announced. He had not seen me for ten years, but he recognized me in the crowd without a moment's hesitation. He ran over a list of books on Syrian and Palestine, stating the merits of each, and ended by saying, I suppose Thomas's The Land in the Book is still the best on the manners and customs. He had the whole literature of the Holy Land at his fingers' ends. When I came to be Mr. Spurgeon's near neighbor, I found that his knowledge of all literature was wonderful. His power of reading was perhaps never equal. He would sit down to five or six large books and master them at one sitting. He sat with his left hand flat on the page at the left side of the book, and pushing his right hand up the page on the right side until the page projected a little, he turned it over with his finger and proceeded to the next page. He took in the contents almost at a glance, reading by sentences as others read by words, and his memory never failed him as to what he read. He made a point of reading half a dozen of the hardest books every week, as he wished to rub his mind up against the strongest minds, and there was no skipping. I several times had an opportunity of testing the thoroughness of his reading, and I never found him at fault. Tremens' natural law in the spiritual world reached him and me about the same time. I called on Mr. Spurgeon when he was fresh from a pursual of the book. It was then unknown to fame and he had read it with four or f five or six other books at tea. We were speaking of the freshness of the illustrations and the particularity of the doctrines taught when a third party challenged Mr. Spurgeon's recollection of certain points. Mr. Spurgeon thereupon quoted a whole page to show that Drummond spoke of the natural and spiritual laws being identical and another important page to show how the book erred by defect. On my return home, I looked over the passages quoted, and I believed he scarcely missed a word in the repetition. His power of swift and effective reading was one of the greatest of his many talents. I was at first surprised to find Mr. Spurgeon consulting both the Hebrew and Greek texts. 
They say, said he, that I am ignorant and unlearned. Well, let them say it. And in everything, by my ignorancy and by my knowledge, let God be glorified. His ecstasies were seldom wrong. He spared no pains to be sure of the exact meaning of his text. On one occasion he was going to preach on the subject of the olive tree, and he sent his secretary to the keeper of the Natural History Department of the British Museum with a series of questions regarding the peculiarities of the tree. Mr. Carruthers, the keeper, was so much interested in the inquiry that he wrote out several pages for Mr. Spurgeon. But when the sermon came to be preached, the information had been passed through the crucible of Mr. Spurgeon's mind and came forth in a few uh, Bunyaniki sentences. Sometimes, when I left him on Saturday evening, he did not know either of his texts for Sunday. But he had a well-stored mind, and when he saw his lines of thought, a few catchwords on a half sheet of note paper sufficed. Before we parted, he used to offer up a small, short prayer, which was an inspiration to both of us. Mr. Spurgeon had a marvelous combination of gifts, which attributed to his greatness a voice that you heard with pleasure and could not help hearing, a mind that absorbed all knowledge, whether from books or nature that came within its range, an eye that took in a wide angle and saw everything within a view, a memory that he treated with confidence and that never disappointed him, a great heart on fire with the love of God and the love of souls. And then he showed a practical common sense in doing things, both sacred and secular, and a singleness of aim, joined with transparent honesty, that ensured the confidence of all who knew him. He could not help loving you could not help loving him if you came within his spell. On two occasions Dr. J. Stanford Holmes wrote specially for transatlantic readers articles upon Mr. Spurgeon's printed sermons and other works in which he endeavored to trace some of the sources of the preacher's literary and spiritual power. The first critique was published in the American edition of the Christian Herald in January 1879. In that paper, Dr. Stanford Holmes wrote, It is a fact worthy of a special notice that the sermons of Mr. Spurgeon have had a circulation in this country entirely without precedence. Of the American edition of his sermons, there have been sold not less than 500,000 volumes. And when to this vast number we add the almost innumerable rep reproductions of single sermons, in the transient periodicals of the day. It is safe to say that no other preacher has had so extensive a hearing in America as Charles H. Spurgeon. Many of the causes of the wonderful popularity of this distinct preacher are not difficult to discover, and freshness and vigor of thought, in simplicity and purity of language, in grasp of gospel truth, in intact and force in its presentation, he is perhaps without a peer in the pulpit. When, in early life, Mr. Spurgeon commenced his ministration in the new Park Street Chapel in London, he quickly filled the old house to overflowing. Soon, he attracted the attention of all England. But he was regarded by many as a brilliant meteor that would soon fade away. But Mr. Spurgeon is today a vastly more efficient and even a more brilliant preacher than he was 20 years ago. He continues to grow in brilliancy as well as in efficiency year by year. No one can yet point to the slightest indication of exhaustion in either his faculties or his resources. This, doubtless, is attributable in a measure to his industry and well-directed application as well as to natural ability and great personal piety. But Mr. Spurgeon's peculiar views of the Word of God and his manner of preparation for the pulpit also tend, in no small degree, to secure the inexhaustible variety which so strikingly characterizes his sermons. It is not his manner to spin, spin his web out of himself. The resources from which he draws are not measured by the strength and the store of his own faculties, but rather by the infinite fullness of the divine Word he never preaches from a topic. He always has a text. 
His text is not a mere motto, but in it he finds his sermon. He uses his text with as much apparent reverency and appreciation as if those few words were the only words that God had ever spoken. The text is the germ which furnishes the life, the spirit, and the substance of the discourse. Every sermon has the peculiar favor, flavor and fragrance and color of the divine sea truth of which it is the growth. Thus, as the Bible is a storehouse of seed truths, inexhaustible and of infinite variety, so Mr. Spurgeon's sermons are never alike. Every seed yields its fruit after its kind. If he brings you up again and again to the same old truths, it is always on a different side, or in a new light, or with new surroundings. A very strong confirmation of this view has been afforded to the author in the preparation of an edition of Mr. Spurgeon's works. In making up the index of subjects, it was necessary to go carefully through the entire 14 volumes, page by page, to note the different topics discussed, and then to arrange them in alphabetical order. When this work was finished, such was the wonderful variety of subject, of thought, and of illustration that, in many thousands of references, no two subjects or thoughts or illustrations were found exactly to correspond. The preacher is discussing essentially the same familiar truths over and over again. He is presenting the same great Savior to lost sa sinners with what might seem slavish fidelity to the Spirit and even to the letter of the written word. And yet his setting forth of truth, his shades of thought, and his modes of illustration always arrange themselves in new forms and colors with well nigh the endless variety of the combinations and tints of these clouds at the setting of the sun. It is not surprising, therefore, that sermons so varied, fresh, and evangelical should have so large a circulation in this country nor that a newspaper, one of the special attractions of which is the weekly sermon of Mr. Spurgeon, should have the reception which is already accorded to the Christian Herald. Dr. Stanford Homie's second article was published in the New York Homiletic Monthly, February 1882. An extract from it will show in what esteem Mr. Spurgeon's man of office was held by the writer. It is with no little satisfaction that I have seen the announcement of an American edition of Mr. Spurgeon's Treasury of David. It is not only a most valuable commentary on the Psalms for general use, but I regard it as the most important homiletic work of the age. Mr. Spurgeon is a good Hebrew scholar. He is a man of deep practical piety. Mr. Spurgeon is a good Hebrew scholar. He is a man of deep practical piety. He has a fine poetic taste, a wonderful insight to the depths of the human heart, an acquaintance of expression, and a vigor and vivacity of style that have the effect of genuine wit in giving point and life in his expressions. These, it will be acknowledged, form a rare combination of qualifications for an expositor of the Book of Psalms. But to these, Mr. Spurgeon adds two other essential qualifications for the work, still more rare and valuable. His appreciation of and reverence for the inspired word are among the most characteristic and remarkable features of the man. The word of God is to him a thing of life and power, and sharper than any two-edged sword. He sees God in the very words of the Bible, like the bush on Horeb, H-O-R-E-B, a chapter or a single verse at times, grows with celestial splendor. And to use his own words hundreds of times, have I as surely felt the presence of God in the page of Scripture as ever Elijah did when he heard the Lord speaking in a still small voice. He seems never to be satisfied in his study of the Scriptures till every single verse is thus verified by the Spirit and becomes to him a living word. 
Another special qualification of Mr. Spurgeon for this work, not less important and extraordinary, is a desire that knows no bounds, a passion to help others preach the gospel of which he himself would seem to be the greatest living hero. When Sir Joshua Reynolds, who was regarded as the greatest painter of his time, scraped off the paint from some of the works of Titan and Da Vinci in order that he might find out the secret of their wonderful skill in the mixing and blending of colors, he refused to make known his discoveries to his pupils. As far as he could, he threw down the ladder by which he had himself obtained to greatness. Mr. Spurgeon is a man of another spirit, himself one of the greatest of living preachers and excelled by few of former ages. He does all he can to reveal the secrets of his power to the world and, if possible, to make other others greater than himself and that which in our estimation makes the treasury of David of such value to a minister is that its spirit and peculiar construction introduce us as witnesses into Mr. Spurgeon's workshop and enables us to see more clearly his method and manner of preparation for the pulpit than we can in his printed discourses or even in his lectures to his students. Here we may examine sermons in all stages of development. Here we may learn how sermons grow. Indeed, a careful study of the treasury of David reveals the whole secret of the strength of this Samson in the pulpit. The mighty work, the work might with pros, uh, propriety be called the treasury of David and the archangelum of Spurgeon. Many other tributes to Mr. Spurgeon's literary ability and achievements have been born, but during his lifetime and since his home going, one of the most representative and comprehensive of these testimonies was given by Dr. James Stalker at the unveiling of Mr. C. H. Spurgeon's memorial at the Stockwell Orphanage on June 20, 1894. After speaking of the loving esteem in which, in common with the great bulk of his fellow countrymen, he held Mr. Spurgeon, Dr. Stalker said, Perhaps you will allow me to say a word or two about his power as a writer, his power to express himself in writing. In this democratic age, when sympathy with the masses is on everyone's lips, it often seems to me wonderful that the power of communicating with the multitude is so rare. We have scores of ministers who are ambitious of writing for the world of the cultivated, but a book frankly and successfully addressing the average man in language which he can understand is one of the rarest products of the press. It really requires very exceptional power. It requires knowledge of human nature and knowledge of life. It requires common sense. It requires wit and humor. It requires command of simple and powerful Saxon. Whatever the requirements may be, Mr. Spurgeon had them in an unexampled degree. To find his match in this respect, you have, I think, in England to go back to John Bunyan. Luther is the unapproachable master in this department, and I am not surprised to see so many pictures of Luther on the walls today collected by Mr. Spurgeon, because there is a close resemblance between the two men. It is wonderful in Luther's life to find how he cultivated this power. When he was at the height of his fame, we find him writing in Nuremberg that he might have sent to him all the clasp books, songs, and children's stories that could be found, that he might exercise himself in the simplicity of expression. Footnote, it is worthy of note that Mr. Spurgeon adopted a very similar method of perfecting his acquaintance with the language and literature of the peasants of England. End of footnote. He said himself that he watched the peasants in the field, the mother in the home, and the boys on the street, that he might learn to speak and to write. He translated Epson's fables and made a large collection of popular proverbs with his own hands. This reminds us of Mr. Spurgeon, who did the same thing on a larger so larger scale in his excellent book called The Salt Cellars. And I am not surprised that Mr. Thomas Spurgeon referred to John Plowman's talk, because in my opinion, that is a collection of wit and wisdom that is certain of immorality among the 
popular classics of England. But it was into the sermons that year after year he poured without stint all the resources of his genius and those fitted the mind and the heart of the multitude of the Anglo-Saxon race as no writings of our day have ever approached doing. But I should like to be allowed to say that while he thus addressed himself so frankly to the common men, he had far more learning than was generally understood. I do not know whether he often refused the degree which you, Dr. Spurgeon, so much adorn. I suppose he did, but I am sure of this, that he earned the degree of a doctor of divinity over and over again. For many years it was it has been my wont, week after week, every season, to read over his commentary on the Psalms, along with the best and most learned commentaries in existence on this subject. That is the best test and the severest test to which a minister can put the writings of any author and Mr. Spurgeon stands the test well. Not only do you everywhere feel the presence of the vigorous and vigilant mind and a heart in thorough sympathy with the spirit of the Psalms, but I wish to say that I have often been perfectly astonished to observe how, without any parade of learning, he shows himself to be thoroughly acquainted with the results of the most advanced scholarship. And the truth is that there is scarcely a point in the Psalms of real importance, scarcely a point upon which scholarship can give us anything of real importance, as to which there are not sufficient hints to the intelligent reader in Mr. Spurgeon's work. To give anything like an approximate idea of the extent of Mr. Spurgeon's reading during his 38 years ministry in London, it would be necessary to make a list of nearly all the principal theological and biblical works published during that period, and to add to it a large portion of the other standard uh, literatures of the present and previous centuries, and almost a whole of the volumes issued by the great divines of the Puritan period. The number and value of Mr. Spurgeon's own copies of the writings of those masters of theology are probably unique for a private library, and he was always on the lookout for any that he did not possess so that he might make his collection as complete as possible. Booksellers' catalogues in which they were mentioned were always examined quickly, and an order for the missing volumes that might be on sale was at once sent, or more probably a messenger was dispatched to make sure of getting them. This promptness on the pastor's part enabled him often to secure treasures which other collectors would have been glad to obtain. In some instances, they endeavored to persuade him to relinquish his bargain in their favor. One gentleman induced Dr. McLaren to write this letter on his behalf to Mr. Spurgeon. Manchester, 7 5 1885. My dear friend, a friend of mine is very wishful to get a book which you unwittingly took out of his mouth from some catalog. I enclose copy of title. The reason for his special desire to get it is that he is descendant from the Fleetwoods to whom it is dedicated, and that, somehow or other, it proves some point of family history in which he and his people are much interested. If you would allow him to purchase it of you at its value, whatever that may be, he would be very much obliged and would undertake that if ever he heard of another copy, you should have it with many thanks. Seeing his anxiety to have the book, I offered to ask you if you would part with it. I hope you are able for your work and are walking in the light. It is sorely shadowed for me, and it is hard to sing or even to say in a darkened cage. I am, my dear friend, yours faithfully, Alexander McLaren. The following is the title of the volume, which was dedicated to Sir William Fleetwood, Sir George Fleetwood, and Lord Fleetwood, Lieutenant General of the whole army in England and Scotland, when Oliver Cromwell was Lord Protector. Old Jacob's altar, newly repaired, or the Satan's triangle of dangers, deliverances, and duties, personal and national, practically improved in many particulars, seasonable and experimental, being the answer of his own heart to God for eminent preservations 
humbly recommended by way of teaching unto all and as a special remembrancer to the ransom of the Lord to awaken in them a sense of rich mercy that they may sing the song of Moses for temporal and the song of the Lamb for spiritual deliverance and to provoke them to love and good works by the defining winning Minister of Arts and Minister of Gospel at all the Wickham, London, printed by R.T. for Neanderthal, uh, Eakins, and are to be sold at a shop at the sign of the Gunny in St. Paul's Churchyard, 1659. Mr. Spurgeon explained to Dr. McLaren his reasons for wishing to retain the volume and received in reply a postcard bearing this message confirming his own decision. I would not part with it either if I were in your place. A. McLaren. The next year, Mr. Spurgeon and Dr. Angus saw in a catalog the peculiars concerning a second-hand volume which each of them desired to possess. The exact copy of the entry will show the kind of book for which the pastor was always on the lookout. 1040, Turner, J. Choice, Expressions of the Kind Dealings of God Before, In, and After Conversions, laid down in six general heads, together with some brief observations upon the same, etc. 1653, Allen, West, General in Ireland, unparenthesized, captive taken from the strong of a true relation of the gracious release of Deborah, H-U-I-S-H, from the power of the tempter, etc. 1658, the just man's defense or the royal conquest in the declaration of the judgment of James A-R-M-I-N-I-U-S of Leyden concerning the principal points of religion before the states of Holland and West Friesland, translated by Tobis C-O-N-Y-E-R-S of Peterhouse, Cambridge, 1657, Faith and Practice of 30 Congregations gathered together, gathered according to the primitive pattern, etc., 1651, etc. In one thick volume, small, 8 VO, old binding, 16 shillings. Mr. Spurgeon secured the volume, and Dr. Angus, on finding this out, wrote to him as follows. College, Regent Park, March 22, 1886. My dear friend, you and I are, off, are often of a mind and very pleasant it is, but now and then it works in conveniency. He ordered on Saturday a book in bull list, which I ordered on Saturday too, but I was behind you. Turner's choice experiences, etc. Do you want them all? I especially want, number one, faith and practice of 30 congregations, and number two, Turner, for the sake of what I expect to be, Spillsbury's recommendations. If you do not want both these, I will take one or both, and will leave you the captive and the judgment of Arminius, which last ought to have some value, though not quite sound, I suspect. I will take what you can spare and give you what you ask for them. If you wish to keep them all, I will not grumble, as it is all in the family. With best wishes, Yours very truly, J. Angus. In this incident, it appears that Mr. Spurgeon gave up his purchase, as Dr. Angus was so anxious to obtain some of the treaties bound up in one volume, and it seemed a pity to separate them. Mr. Spurgeon not only possessed a large number of volumes by Puritan writers, but he was fully conversant with their con contents, and from the earliest days of the pastor's college he sought to interest his students in them. He also helped them to purchase considerable quantities of the new editions issued by Mr. Nickel, Monsignor, Nisbet, and Company, and other publishers. In later years, the president prepared a series of lectures on several of the principal Puritan divines and delivered them at the college, accompanying the sketches of their lives with extracts from their works, thus enabling the brethren to become acquainted with his opinions of their comparative merits and of the characteristics of their style. The lectures, 
have not yet been published, but just to hint as to the labor involved in compiling them and some idea of the way in which the writers were compared and contrasted may be gathered by the prefix to one of Mr. Spurgeon's small volumes, Illustrations and Meditations, or Flowers from a Puritan Garden, distilled and dispensed by C.H. Burden, in which he wrote, While commenting upon the 119th Psalm, I was brought into most intimate, intimate communion with Thomas Manton, who had discoursed upon that marvelous portion of scripture with great fullness and power, who has, uh, I have come to know him so well that I could pick him out from among a thousand divines if he were again to put on his portly form and display among modern men the countenance were in was a great mixture of majesty and meekness. His works occupy 22 volumes in the modern reprint. A modern a mighty mountain of solid theology. They mostly consist of sermons. But what sermons? They are not so sparkling as those of Henry Smith, nor so profound as that of Owen, no, or, nor so rhetorical as those of Howey, nor so pithy as those of Watson, nor so fan, fantastic as books of Brooks, and yet they are second to none of these. For solid, sensible instruction, forcible, delivered, they cannot be surpassed. Manton is not brilliant, but he is always clear. He is not heretical, but he is powerful. He is not striking, but he is deep. There is not a poor discourse in the whole collection. They are even good, consistent, excellent. Ministers who do not know Manton need not wonder if they are themselves unknown. Inasmuch as Manton used but few figures and illustrations, it came into my head to note them all, for I felt sure that they would be very natural and forcible. I thought it worthwhile to go through volume after volume and mark the metaphors, and then I resolved to complete the task by calling the best figures out of the whole of Manton's works. Thus my communion with the great Puritan ends in my clearing his house of all his pictures and hanging them up in new frames of my own. As I leave his right to them unquestioned and unconcealed, I do not rob him. The rather I increase his influence by giving him another opportunity of speaking for his Lord and Master. One kind of work leads on to another, and labor is lightened by being diversified. Had it not been for the treasury of David, I might not have been found spending so much time among the metaphors of Manton. To successive generations of students, Mr. Spurgeon read Dr. James Hamilton's four volumes of Christian classics. It was a treat to the brethren to hear such a work read by one who could so thoroughly appreciate it. But they probably enjoyed even more the comments and criticisms upon the various readers and their works with which the reading were interdispersed. It was rarely indeed that the president found any mention of an author with whose writings he, he was not thoroughly familiar. He also constantly gave the students helpful hints garnered, garnered by, from his own experience with regard to the books likely to be most useful to them both during their college course and afterwards when settled in the ministry or in the foreign mission field. The informal gatherings under the Questioning Oak, the Question Oak at Westwood, afforded many opportunities for the brethren to ascertain Mr. Spurgeon's opinion upon literary matters in general and especially to learn from him all that they could concerning the books which most affected them as theological students. One of the questions put to the president was, should novel reading be indulged? other ministers. His reply was, that depends upon what you mean by a novel. The Pilgrim's Progress and many of the best books we have are novels, in the sense that they are not actual records of fact, though they are absolutely true to Christian experience. Then, again, there are such works as Sir Walter Scott's. Many of them are founded on facts and are well worth reading as a picture of the people and places 
he so admirably describes, as well as for the style of his writing. Their value lies largely in their historical truth. Some of Charles Dickens' works are worth reading, although he does he has given gross caricatures of the religious life of his times. As for the general run of novels not being issued to such close, you will probably be wise to leave them alone. Few of them will be likely to do you any good, and many of them are more morally tainted or worse. At one of the meetings under the oak, Mr. Spurgeon told the students that he had read Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress at least a hundred times, and that as a kind of mental relaxation he had constantly returned to the study of various branches of natural history, and for a change he had turned his attention to astronomy, botany, and other sciences. In his published lecture on astronomy as the source of illustration, he showed their brethren how all the sciences could be utilized as illustration of Christian life and work. He also said that he always liked to have a few good biographies handy, so that he could turn to the record of the Lord had enabled his servant, servants to do in the past. His own collection of the lives of notable individuals was a very expensive one, and in conversation with him, it was soon evident that he was fully aware of the main facts in the careers of almost all of them. Indeed, it was impossible to mention anyone who had been eminently useful or notorious in the world to find that Mr. Spurgeon was ignorant of the man or woman referred to. In most instances, he had made himself more completely acquainted with their histories by giving lectures upon them to his congregation or students, or by writing summaries of their biographies for the benefit of the readers of his magazine. Pastor W. Williams has preserved in his personal references of Charles Haddon Spurgeon the following jottings concerning his beloved president's allusions to literary matters, which will serve as specimens of the remarks that Mr. Spurgeon frequently made when conversing with his friends. What books are you reading now? He asked me one day. Carlyle's French Revolution, I answered. Very good. It is a fine work, full of nervous, branching thought and stirring facts. But I think it cannot be appreciated as its true worth unless simpler historians of France have been read before beginning it. I would not advise anyone to take Carlyle as a first study. Scott's Life of Napoleon is a good history. That first Napoleon was a really great man. He had a mind, and no mistake, his successors had been insignificant in comparison. You like Botswell's Johnson's, sir, of course? Oh, yes, that is the biography. It stands unraveled, and probably ever will. And I think Lockhart's Life of Scott and Mrs. Uh, Olifitz's Life of Edward Irving come next. You, you've not read Pickwick's um, Williams? No, I have not yet. Oh dear, I was going to say I wish I had not, for I should like once more to enjoy it, as I did at the first reading. You have a treat in store. The humor of it is about perfect. The story of the Nations series greatly interested him. He read Egypt through at least three times and eagerly turned up the others as they came out. It was exceedingly entertaining and instructive to hear him talk about the peoples and countries with which the volumes deal. We had several talks on different occasions about Shakespeare. He had read all his plays and some of them many times. Saturdays at Westwood gave me an education in the matter of many choice books and I seldom came away without one or two. But it was a greater treat still to hear Mr. Spurgeon himself read some charming poem or instructive chapter. I remember when Mrs. Havengill's poems under the surface were issued, how he reveled in them, the one entitled From Glory Unto Glory. One he read one evening over the teacups. His eyes sparkled from with delight and filled with tears of joy as he reached the third or fourth stanza of that magnificent song. On several occasions, Mr. Spurgeon found himself in the company of a number of high church clergymen, 
and they were always greatly surprised to find that the Baptist minister was far more familiar with the works of their own side of the controversy than they themselves were. They also discovered that, while he spoke heartily in commendation of all that appeared to him to be scriptural in the writings of Dr. Posse, Dr. Neely, Dr. Littledale, Isaac Williams, and other divines of their school of thought, he was able to give good reasons for not accepting their sacramentarium and their sacerdotal theories. The same characteristic is very manifest in his remarks upon the ritualistic works referred to in his com com commenting and commentaries. Space not only to be spared for one from fairly representative incident. Dr. John Manson Neely's sermons on the canticles preached in a religious house upon which Mr. Spurgeon thus comments, by that highest of high churchmen, Dr. Neely, these sermons smell of popery. Yet the Savior of our Lord's good ointment cannot be hid. Our Protestantism is not of so questionable a character that we are afraid to do justice to Papists and Anglicans. And therefore we do not hesitate to say that many a devout thought has come to us while reading these sermons of a priest of the Church of England. Other people besides theologians often notice the extensive and varied knowledge that Mr. Spurgeon possessed. On one of his visits to Mantone, he was in the company of an eminent medical man. And after a while, the conversation drifted round to anatomy physiology, various diseases to which flesh is air, hair, and the different modes of treatment adopted for their removal. The doctor was quite astonished at the completeness of his companion's acquaintance with every part of the subject, and he afterwards said, Mr. Spurgeon is one of the most remarkable men I ever met. He seems to know as much about human body as any medical man might have done. He would have made a splendid physician. Among the pastor's hearers at the tabernacle in, or in various seaport towns, many sailors have often been found listening with an intense eagerness, and the men of the sea have often testified that they have never known him make a mistake in his nautical illusions. And only recently, Reverend James Neal, M.A., who spent 20 years in Palestine, has borne similar witness to the accuracy of Mr. Spurgeon's descriptions of biblical manners and customs, thereby confirming the verdict by Dr. Wright, mentioned in the previous part of the present chapter. Many of John Plowman's readers have wondered that he could tell them so much about how to plow and sow and reap and mow. Part of that familiarity with farming affairs no doubt dated back to his early visits to Stamboni, and his walks among the pharaohs by the side of the goodly, godly plowman, Will Richardson, in part must be attributed to his constant preaching in different parts of the kingdom, and to the opportunities thus afforded of obtaining further information concerning agricultural pursuits, but extensive reading also added to the effectiveness of his references to such matters. Pastor Charles Spurgeon related to the previous volume of his work the testimony of a farmer who said that the pastor of the Metropolitan Tabernacle knew far more about sheep than he did, though he had been keeping them all his life. The explanation of that fact can probably be found in the pastor's observation to his students that at one time he had made a special study of sheep and their habits. The library at Westwood still contains a volume to which Mr. Spurgeon then referred at an intricated volume entitled A System of Sheep Grazing and Management as Practiced in Romney Marsh by Daniel Price. Richard Phillips, Blackfires. Singularly enough, at a later period, the pastor's attention was, through someone's mistake, again attracted to the same subject. He had written for a number of books on quite a different theme, but in some unaccountable way there came in the place of one of them a large octavo volume titled Sheep, Their Breeds, Managements, and Diseases by William 
UAC, Simpleton's Marshall and Company. Mr. Spurgeon was amused at the blunder, but he kept the book, which still retraces, retains traces of having been carefully examined and used by him. At another time, he had collected all the old herbals he could buy, and he had found much of interest and instruction in them. Topographic was also one of the side subjects to which he devoted a portion of his scanty lectures, and in the course of his researches upon this subject, he was brought into association with lovers of antiquity and topographical lore in various parts of the country, and by their kind assistance, he was able to make further welcome additions to his already well-stored library. If he was going to preach in a district that was new to him, he was to try to find out everything of interest in its history, surroundings, manufacturers, or products, and these would, in due course, guide him in his local allusions and illustrations, and materially help to impress his message upon his hearers' minds and hearts. Everything was made subservient to the one great object he had before him, the glory of God and the salvation of sinners and the extension of the Redeemer's kingdom. End of chapter 100, having been read by Peter John Parisis, also known as Brian Dean. None of my audios are copyrighted. Please feel free to make as many copies as you desire. This is the autobiography of C.H. Spurgeon, volume 4 of 4, end of chapter 100.